नमस्कार टू ऑल लिस्नर्स टुडे वी हैव विथ अस वर्ल्ड रिनाउंड इंडियन साइंटिस्ट प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर अशोक सेन ही हैज मेड पायोनियरिंग कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन्स टू द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ स्ट्रिंग थेरी ही हैज बीन अवॉर्डेड द आई सी टी पी प्राइज इन नाइनटीन एटी नाइन शांती स्वरूप भटनागर अवॉर्ड इन नाइनटीन नाइंटी फोर द थर्ड वर्ल्ड अकेडमी प्राइज इन नाइनटीन नाइंटी सेवन पद्मश्री इन टू थाउजंड वन प्रेस्टिजियस फंडामेंटल फिजिक्स प्राइज इन टू थाउजंड ट्वेल्व पद्मभूषण इन टू थाउजंड थर्टीन ही हैज बीन इलेक्टेड एज अ फेलो ऑफ द इंडियन अकेडमी ऑफ साइंसेस इंडियन नैशनल साइंस अकेडमी रॉयल सोसायटी ऑफ लंडन ही हैज रिसीव्ड मेनी अदर फेलोशिप्स अवॉर्ड्स मेडल्स एंड ऑनररी डॉक्टरेट्स फ्रॉम वेरियस ऑर्गनाइजेशन एंड यूनिवर्सिटीज अराउंड द वर्ल्ड डॉक्टर सेन वेलकम टू ऑल इंडिया रेडियो थैंक यू वेरी मच सर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल प्लीज टेल अस हाउ वॉज युअर चाइल्डहूड एंड हाउ एंड सीन्स वेन डिड यू बिकम इंटरेस्टेड इन साइंस well i would say my childhood was a normal childhood uh, i went to a local school near our house and about my interest in science i would say that it, uh, it it's it's not that it uh, grew at one go i mean it i it slowly developed so uh, my cousin used to bring some science books for me to read because he was himself interested in science so that that probably is one of the reasons and then i used to discuss with my father mostly mathematics rather than physics your father was professor of physics at scottish church college kolkata how his profession and knowledge did help you in developing interest in science yeah i think certainly the fact that he was a professor in physics meant that i knew at least that there is subject called physics and that certainly helped and as i said i used to discuss uh, uh, mostly mathematics with my father when he tutored me hmm. in mathematics but perhaps the one that drew me to science most is the atmosphere at that time that uh, when for example when i joined presidency college uh, physics department i found that uh, five of the top 10 rank holders in the board exam were my classmates and perhaps that was one of the reasons please tell us about your phd days at stony brook university what was your phd thesis about and how did this help you in shaping your future career My PhD thesis was on something called quantum chromodynamics which is a theory of strong interactions and I did some particular problem in that thesis which of course it was a good training for me I mean I still use what I did at that time but I think more importantly what it the PhD taught me was how to think of problems how to do research how to solve problems and so on so it's more that I came to know what research is about how and when did you develop interest in string theory and when did you decide to make your career or focus your research work on string theory after my phd i went to formi national accelerator laboratory in chicago for my post doctoral fellowship that time i worked on various things but uh, i think it was probably near the beginning of 1984 that i started reading something about string theory hmm. because uh, i mean gravity was one of the subjects that uh, people knew is the in in a sense the last frontier because quantizing uh, combining gravity with quantum mechanics mm -hmm. each of which have been experimentally verified to great accuracy i mean that was a problem that combining gravity with quantum mechanics mm -hmm. and then i found a review article which explained what string theory is and how it tries to combine gravity with quantum mechanics mm -hmm. so that's how i started thinking about string theory but i think what sparked my interest at the end was that in the late 1984 Hmm. there is a paper by two authors uh, michael green and john swartz which actually actually showed some consistency condition in string theory can you please tell us about uh, what string theory is in simple terms so that our common listeners can understand who and when did first coin the term string and what does it mean you know, see string theory is essentially the idea that uh, normally when you try to think of uh, theories of uh, elementary constituents of matter we regard the elementary constituents as particles or point like objects okay. okay and that's the way for example the theories of strong weak and electromagnetic forces are explained and they have been highly successful but the problem is that when you try to apply the same technique to gravity mm. it doesn't quite work mm. okay and that was one of the outstanding problems that was the problem of combining gravity with quantum mechanics the string theory was discovered in late uh, 60s which was uh, as in still high school and it was discovered for quite a different reason i mean people were trying to look for theories of strong interactions at that time 
but then people soon realized that it's perhaps not the best candidate for describing a theory of strong interactions and it went into dormancy but at that time itself people knew about the fact that uh, strings are the basic fundamental building blocks of that theory okay that approach to strong interactions but then in the mid 70s i mean the people discovered that strings can actually describe gravity that even though string theory was not successful as a theory of strong forces i mean it automatically somehow incorporates gravity and that was a big surprise that it's a fully uh, consistent with quantum theory and it incorporates gravity so that's how string theory started is a string a particle or a wave what are its properties okay a string is not a particle it's as i said it's like a one dimensional object you can think mm. of a closed loop which is the, those are the elementary building blocks but it's so small in size that to naked eye it still looks like a particle so okay. in a sense you can say that strings can be approximated by particles but it's not really particle but at the same time it's also fully consistent with quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics tells us that there is a duality between particles and waves in string theory that translates to a duality between strings and uh, waves okay so even though it's not uh, strings are not particles there is still a wave mechanics that describes the theory of strings okay so you can view it either as strings or as waves is there any conclusive proof found about existence of strings eps what is it yeah certainly there is no conclusive proof the major reason that people work on string theory is that right now it seems to be the only candidate for a theory that combines quantum mechanics and gravity and we certainly know that gravity is there there is conclusive proof for for gravity then there is a conclusive proof for quantum mechanics mm-hmm. and string theory succeeds in combining the two and as i said this was of course understood even in the mid 70s mm-hmm. but since the middle of 1980s after this discovery of green and swartz of consistency of string theory people began to realize that it can also incorporate other forces so it, in a sense it can describe a unified theory mm-hmm. of yes. all forces in nature but so far i mean we don't know if it's true or not okay people are still working on it there are ideas of how the universe began for example mm-hmm. in a quantum theory of gravity but that's still a research topic so while it is true that string theory is relevant for the beginning of the universe we still don't know the full story you have made important contributions in s duality unstable d brains and famous sin conjecture about open string tachyon condensation on such brains please tell us more about that in simple terms so that our listeners can have some idea about that okay so let me begin with s duality i mean i'll try to not explain the technical terms but exactly mm-hmm. yes uh, in a sense uh, Uh, what it does to string theory so as i said in the middle of 80s people discovered that string theory can be successful in combining theories of gravity and other forces but during that time people also realized that there are actually five consistent strings okay, which seems to be perfectly mathematically consistent they are all consistent with each uh, internally but then the question was that of if we are looking for a theory of nature and nature of course is unique we, we believe that there is a unique set of laws that describe nature then how is it that there are five consistent string theories okay because then which one of those describe nature okay so no string theory seems to play a special role in uh, describing nature so how does nature choose and this is where this uh, idea of s duality came in okay i mean of course what i'm describing is just one small piece of what mm-hmm. okay which was later developed into the final results and basically the final outcome of the study of s duality was that even though these string theories look different they are actually different ways of describing the same thing okay so in a sense instead of having five consistent uh, string theories we really have only one theory and these five consistent uh, what people thought are five consistent theories are like different ways of describing okay it's like the story of uh, five blind persons feeling an elephant that you feel different parts of the elephant from different uh, sides and then initially you don't realize that they are you are actually exploring the same object but eventually one realizes that indeed there is a single theory which you are exploring in different parts from different points of view so that was uh, the idea of s duality mm-hmm. so this unstable d brains and tachyon condensation so let me again try to explain in some simple terms what was originally coined 
to describe a particle that travels faster than light, okay, and which of course looks very unphysical. But then it was also realized uh, soon that there is another view of tachyon, okay, and that is the following: that imagine that you have a particle moving on a hill, and we place the particle at the bottom of the hill, and if you give it a small push, and the particle will go back and forth near the bottom of the hill; it will not go very far. Okay, so you can somehow assume that the motion is small and try to find appropriate approximation to describe the motion of the particle. But now if the particle is sitting at the top of a hill and if you give it a small push, you know that the particle is going to roll down the hill. Okay, it will go very far away from where it was originally. But suppose you want to try to describe the, this motion by assuming that the motion is small, okay, that the particle moves a little bit. Then clearly you are going to run into an inconsistent uh, picture. And what people found that a version of this, okay, in a in what is what people call quantum field theory, there is a version of this in quantum field theory, okay, where you try to you try to describe the motion of a quantum field near the top of a hill using the approximation that the motion is small. Then you encounter these tachyons, okay, as if there is there are particles which move faster than light. Mm -hmm. But you also know that this is the re the reason that uh, you find this is because you are not making a correct approximation. Okay, that you have done something wrong and that's why you discover time. So now coming to string theory, okay, string theory also, the people knew that certain objects in string theory has tachyons of this kind. But because it was not described in the conventional language of quantum field theory, people didn't know that if those tachyons also represent some things that you are doing wrong, okay, mm -hmm. whether that those tachyons have similar interpretation and if they do have similar interpretation, then what is the analog of the bottom of the hill? Okay, mm -hmm. where you can actually describe the motion by small movements around the bottom. Mm -hmm. So this is where uh, my work comes in, that I ex this conjecture started by saying that there, I, I made a proposal that these tachyons are of the same kind that we encountered in quantum field theory, that you are moving near the top of a hill. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, this conjecture also explained, also gave a proposal as to what the bottom of the hill is. And so then we studied this numerically and we found a lot of uh, strong evidence. But this was later proved by a physicist called Martin Snabel. So now it's not a conjecture anymore. Okay, we know that, that that's what happens to these tachyons. You have also published many important research papers in string field theory. So how this string field theory and string theory are different or are the same? Yeah, so they are not different. String field theory in some sense is a way to describe string theory okay is a particular method for describing string theory mm -hmm. and it's like the difference between quantum mechanics and quantum field theory okay many of the properties of particles can be described just by quantum mechanics but then what you find is that when you try to describe more complicated properties the language of quantum mechanics is a little insufficient mm -hmm. okay? and so you have to generalize that to what is called quantum field theory mm -hmm. so string field theory is similar that you can describe many of the properties of strings just in terms of quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. but then some things don't, uh, I mean, quite work, okay, that you run into difficulties in certain aspects, and there you develop this technology called string field theory, which does what quantum field theory does to quantum mechanics. Okay. So it's certainly not a new theory, it's just a way to study string theory. It is said that string theory talks about 11 or more dimensions. Generally, we know about the three dimensions and time is considered at, considered as fourth dimension. So what are these fifth, sixth and other dimensions? How can you explain this in simple terms? Yeah, so string theory tells us that intrinsically space and time will have 10 dimensions. Okay, or sometimes in some limit it can also look like 11 dimensions. But, so let me again explain this by a, uh, an example, okay, because we cannot really visualize uh, 10 dimensions in our uh, mind. Okay. So let's imagine that you have a cylinder okay, and you have a surface of a cylinder. So that's like a two-dimensional surface. Now, it looks two-dimensional to us, hmm. but now imagine that uh, we make this size, the radius of that uh, cylinder, smaller and smaller. Okay. So as you make it smaller and smaller, it will start looking like one-dimensional object. And indeed, if you have a mm -hmm. cylinder okay, whose radius is smaller than the resolution of your eye, you will not know that uh, it's a mm -hmm. two-dimensional object. Mm -hmm. The surface is two-dimensional. You will think yeah. that it's one-dimensional. 
So while it's intrinsically two dimensional, it can be made to look one dimensional by making some directions smaller. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the idea that works in string theory. That what string theory tells us that intrinsically our space has nine dimensions. Okay, and if we add time, it's ten dimensional. Mm -hmm. But the some of the dimensions, in particular six of the dimensions, are so small that okay. you know, we cannot see it with our naked eye, and we cannot see it with the microscopes that we have today which are the particle accelerators. Those are the ones which probe the smallest distance. And that's the way string theory makes connection with nature that um, even though intrinsically it, ha it has nine space dimensions, six of the dimensions are so small that we cannot see them. But of course, this doesn't mean that we can never see them. If we do have microscopes that are powerful enough, which means building bigger and bigger particle accelerators, then eventually we'll see them. Okay? And that's, that's, so that will be the way you can directly test string theory. But okay, this is not, of course, we don't expect that it, it, such an accelerator will be built in the near future. Mm. So people are looking for indirect evidence because in the early universe, for example, when the temperature was very high, particles did have very, very high energy. Okay. And one of the questions that people are exploring is whether at that time, okay, of course, we could have produced, seen these strings, those particles would have been, would have seen these strings and they that there's a relic of that, mm. that you can see today. String theory is considered as one of the proposed candidate for theory of everything. So what is theory of everything? What is it, its need? Well, theory of everything essentially means that we, we want one consistent theory that can explain all the elementary particle, uh, elementary constituents and their forces. Because um, after all, if you, if you do have, say, different theories for gravity, okay? Imagine that you have different theories for gravity and for strong, weak and electromagnetic forces. Then, if you take a particle that has both gravity and which has strong weak and electromagnetic force, take a proton, for example, which certainly has the other three forces and we also know it has gravity. Because after all, the Earth is made of nuclei, finally, and Earth certainly has gravity. If you have separate theories for describing these um, different kinds of forces, then what do you do with a particle that has both, right, which has both strong weak electromagnetic forces and gravity? So that's the need that we need a unified theory, okay, which should be able to describe all forces and their and all constituents and their forces. Now, it is true also at the same time that approximately we can treat gravity and these other forces as separate. Okay, and that's the way we want. I mean, for example, we can we learn we know a lot, lot about nature, both gravitational aspects as well as these other forces, because so far the kind of experiments that we can perform or kind of observations that we see mostly can be studied separately in the gravitational sector and in the yeah. other force sector. But this is not a general story. Okay, it, it happens to be the case for based on what we can observe today. But if you're looking for something that describes nature at a fundamental level, then this is not sufficient. You do need to have a theory that has that can describe all forces. Do string theory believe in Big Bang model of creation of universe? If yes, what does it tell about the situation before the Big Bang? Yes, certainly string theory is very much consistent with Big Bang because Big Bang, after all, came from by from a theory of gravity. Okay, and since string theory has gravity, it has Big Bang. But when I say that it has Big Bang, it I mean the following: that if we follow out the history of our universe to the past, then we can use the Big Bang theory okay, to describe the past to almost at the beginning. But you also know that the Big Bang theory has what is called singularities where the gravitational forces become infinite. There you know that the theory that you are using is not correct. Okay, In fact, that's one of the places where string theory will become important. Because um, when gravity becomes strong, okay, mm -hmm. gravity and quantum mechanics are both, both important at that uh, scale. And that's where uh, string theory comes in. So certainly, string theory has very much to do with Big Bang. But unfortunately, at present, we do not quite know how string theory uh, deals with Big Bang. Okay. We are starting to learn this by in the context of black holes, for example, because black holes are very similar infinities that we see. And string theory has studied black holes to a great extent. But the final story is still not written. Okay, So we still don't know what how string theory will eventually combine with the very beginning of the universe. Or, I mean, it's not even clear that there should be something before the beginning. Okay, Because the, there is one version of this theory where the universe actually was created by quantum fluctuations at the time of the Big Bang. So, but all these questions we'll hope to eventually answer using something like string theory. Does string theory have anything to say about origin of life 
or evolution of more complex life forms from single cell organisms well in a sense yes but in, in practice no okay so let me explain what uh, i mean by this that because string theory if, if it's true then it will describe the origin of all forces of nature okay, and all particles mm -hmm. and because all of us okay whether uh, living objects or non living objects they are all made of the same particles and they um, interact by same forces yes in that sense of course string theory has something to do with development of life but at the same time you imagine that uh, we know that uh, we are made of uh, at at some level okay the protons neutrons and electrons that that describe us okay now they may be made of something smaller but let's not worry about it right now the protons neutrons and electrons make us so whatever we do is controlled by their their forces but when you do cooking for example i mean we don't worry about how the protons neutrons and electrons inside the food okay inside the meat or vegetables or spices mm. are interacting with each other right mm. that you could do that in principle mm. but in practice nobody ever does that and it's the same story here that um, in principle you could start from strings and start try to build the whole story but that's not that's not a very efficient thing to do and that's not the way we do science mm. so we write down some kind of effective description in terms of molecules mm. and atoms and that's what you used to try to understand the origin of life okay? no. because and the and the particular way the molecules and atoms behave of course as is controlled by string theory okay? but you don't have to go all the way back to string theory mm -hmm. for studying this just like you don't go all the way back to protons and neutrons and electrons mm -hmm. for learning to cook there is one famous quote of albert einstein the distinction between past present and future is nothing but stubbornly persistent illusion what's your and string theories take on this okay i don't know exactly in what context context einstein made this uh, statement certainly one one context i can think of is the theory of relativity he does have a lot of special theory of relativity and that mm -hmm. basically says that these different frames you can just go back and forth between different frames and they are all equivalent so the apparent difference between a object at rest and object moving that they feel differently okay because of the environment but that's just an illusion and so if that's the sense in which uh, this statement i is interpreted then certainly string theory is very much consistent with special theory of relativity mm -hmm. and also general theory of relativity which is the theory of gravity that also einstein developed so in that sense i would say yes indeed string theory is perfectly consistent with uh, this statement what are some observational and mathematical conclusive evidences that are necessary to prove string theory well if string theory is really successful okay, in the way we hope it will be then there are many things that one can many observations which already exist for example if string theory is successful then we should be able to calculate the mass of the electron mm. from first principle in the correct in the current uh, approach to the theory of elementary particles the mass of the electron is just regarded as some parameter mm. okay, some constant that you determine from experiment but a, a fully successful implementation of string theory should be able to calculate the mass of the electron Uh, this certainly has not been done so this is one observational consequences and there are many others okay on the, if, if you want to find a consequence which is perhaps more experiment oriented as i said if you can actually produce energies that are high enough you should start saying strings because um, strings have very very small size but it's small but not uh, zero okay they have finite size so a sufficiently high energy experiment okay or equivalently sufficiently strong microscope should be able to see the string structure and we also try to see if this kind of experiment was already performed in the early universe okay and and leaving behind some direct uh, indirect consequences that we can observe so these are the various observational consequences of string theory and of course mathematical consequences there are many okay and many of them have been tested as i said there are fact that um, string theory has this five different descriptions means that we can calculate some quantity in many different ways okay in, from this five different points of view and then you can ask whether they agree because it's only if they agree that they, that uh, you can uh, say that uh, this duality between these different descriptions is true and there are many uh, i mean their agreement is highly non trivial and they have like, led to many mathematical results some equation whose two sides look completely different and in fact many of those when they are false proposed even the mathematicians didn't know about those equations but i would say most of them have been proven okay mm -hmm. not all of them but most of them have been proven and nothing has been found to be wrong okay so whatever prediction 
about mathematics that string theory has made so far they have either been proven or they are still open what do you think will be the implications on physics and science if string theory will be proven true with sufficient conclusive proofs well if string theory is proven true that i would say is provides the understanding of the basic constituents of matter okay, how with the basic constituents what the basic constituents are and what forces they exert on each other we will know everything about that but that of course as i said doesn't explain everything because starting from that okay you have to also the go at lower energies or larger length scales hmm. and ask how those various events can be explained okay for example as you mentioned the origin of life for example as i said string theory in principle has should have the information about the forces that gave rise to origin of life but that doesn't mean that you understand the origin of life once you know string theory okay that is something that you have to work out based on the forces between molecules hmm. okay which in turn can be thought of as, as coming from forces between strings so certainly physics and science will not stop there are many things to understand to be understood even if you understand what the basic constituents of matter are and how what the forces are uh, doing long mathematical con- calculations waiting for long periods for observational evidences are very hectic tasks many times scientists don't get their desired or expected results so how do you keep yourself motivated on this research path yeah i think they are the only way to keep yourself motivated is if you like the process itself yes. because in a subject like ours like theoretical physics hmm. most of the time you are not getting anywhere you are stuck when things start moving it happens very fast yes and then you get stuck again and then for most of the time you don't get anything and if you don't enjoy that struggle then i mean it's very hard okay hmm. so you have to enjoy the process of getting there Okay, not just the final result because most of the time that's what you are just struggling to get get there, and that different people learn how to cope with this. Okay, mm-hmm. for example, I find that it's that when I'm stuck, it often helps if I just start reading something else. Okay, somebody else's paper which has maybe which is in a, in a quite a different topic than what I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Okay, but other people probably use different strategies. But the main point is that you you have to be able to. enjoy the struggle that uh, of getting there one last final question what is your life's philosophy well i am not a very philosophical person uh, <laughs> but uh, let's see okay at a fundamental level i mean i believe that uh, i as well as uh, everybody else is made of exactly the same elementary constituents as a mountain or a goat or a distant star yes true so it's everything is made of the same elementary constituents but somehow the laws of nature and the elementary constituents conspire to make us okay who of course follow the laws of nature but following the laws of nature you are also able to understand how nature works and for all you know we may be the only ones in the universe who can do this okay there may be of course other intelligent uh, life but we don't know and given this i try to basically make use of this ability and try to understand nature as much as i can and that's that's i would say is what my life philosophy is sir thank you very much for sharing your very valuable knowledge and talking to us thank, thank you. you very much thank you sir